Welcome back to our special webcast, our extended webcast of the county seat. Our topic today is uh, the wilderness issue and the impact it will have on the economy. A group of economists uh, recently uh, requested that President Obama uh, uh, accelerate the protection of wilderness lands so that it would create more tourism and recreational jobs. And that's been the focus of our conversation on the regular broadcast. We're going to continue it now. Joining us is the uh, chairman of the Garfield County Commission, Claire Ramsey. We have George Pyle, who is an editorial writer for the Salt Lake Tribune, and Mark Ward from the Utah Association of Counties. And uh, let's go back, just as the producer suggested, and talk about the money side of it, because that's what this editorial is referring to. And I'll just throw it out on the table and see which dog attacks the steak. <laughs> Go ahead, Claire. I'll start it off. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, we have a half a million acres of WSAs in Garfield County, 25,000 acres of wilderness, Box Death Hollow in Escalante. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, the wilderness areas in Garfield County has contributed nothing to the economy of Garfield County. How so? Just nothing. Okay. Yeah. I, there's, I, I don't. I don't see anyone coming to Garfield County to visit the wilderness areas. Okay, they're more yeah. like doing trendy. They, the may, they may be a yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, a sideline, but uh, mm -hmm. sideline. But uh, mm -hmm. as far as being a destination, people don't come to Garfield County to visit the wilderness. Okay. Well, it's just that's been the the contention of the the economists who have looked into this. And they said that uh, often, even in a recessionary time, the areas around a national monument or a wilderness will pick up business, will pick up uh, population, will pick up uh, economy. They're basing a lot of what they say on the fact that their view that America is shifting more and more to a service economy and less and less to a manufacturing extractive economy. These are the things that, that are sustainable over time. You don't have the, the problem with the mining company moving in, digging a big hole, uh, moving in a lot of people, and then the, the county is faced with having to build roads, having to build schools, uh, having to build uh, community services for a population that isn't going to be there for the long haul. They're only going to be there until the vein is tapped out or the, or the well goes dry, and then they leave. And then they leave uh, the county and the city with uh, a, a ghost town and a, a tax base that peaked and, and bust. Mark, Mark did have one good comment uh, about um, uh, you know, managing, because you can't manage wilderness at all. And um, you know, if, if you look out on the Tavaputs on the eastern part of the state, the areas that have been rehabilitated, and I would not have believed this had I not seen it in person, mm -hmm. the areas that have been rehabilitated after they take the gas wells out, draw more wildlife mm -hmm. and are healthier than the areas surrounding them that haven't been touched. And, and so there's probably an argument to be made about uh, getting the, uh, you know, at least if you've got a different kind of designation mm -hmm. that supports recreation in a broader vein than the very few people who can access wilderness, that that, that probably would be better. Chad, I'd like to comment a little bit about the study on which the uh, Salt Lake Tribune editorial is based. Mm -hmm. That study, one of the centerpieces of that study was the Grand County model, they mm -hmm. called it. Um, also, that study blended together not just wilderness areas, but national parks and other, sp and other special designations. So, for a couple of reasons, that study is really not a good uh, projection uh, of the economic benefits of wilderness. Mm -hmm. Because you look at the Grand County experience. What's the typical tourist doing when he comes to Grand County? He's either coming in with his Jeep or his OHV. Or his mountain bike. Or his mountain bike. Mm -hmm. Those are not wilderness vehicles. Those are not tools of wilderness recreation. Is repelling? It could be. But again, the, the, the common denominator for, for wilderness is you got to do it on foot. So even uh, repellers, I would have to say, wait a minute, how'd they get to that cliff? Did they do so uh, with a motorized vehicle? <clears throat> Not wilderness. Mm -hmm. And so when you really take a close look at what drives the, the, the economic engine in, in Moab, those are not wilderness activities. Uh, there, there is a, another study, which I think is more on point. It was done by two professors from University, Utah State University, uh, Simmons and Steed, and an SUU professor named Yonk. They isolated just on wilderness. 
and they did a nationwide study, and they looked for, they isolated on, on uh, all kinds of economic variables, how scientists do, and in very convincing fashion, they looked for whether or not wilderness had any economic effect on a given county. They found zero correlation of positive economic uptick, and they found a debatable negative downtick from wilderness. I, th I submit that is, uh, that's the kind of study that I think should be looked at more closely here in this state for the wilderness debate. And one more quick thing about, about management. It's uh, <clears throat> a secret that gets glossed over. It's really not a secret. It's a fact that gets glossed over a lot. The main kind of energy development that takes place in Utah is not open pit mining, mm -hmm. at least not on public lands. The main kind of energy development is isolated drilling for oil or for gas. BLM and Forest Service require each drilling company for every acre that they disturb through the drilling, mm -hmm. they have to reclaim multiple acres, meaning they have, to take, they have to take old scars on land and they have to reclaim them, they have to reseed them, they have to make them look like natural again. So uh, it's, if you want more reclamation, I know it sounds counterintuitive, and you don't have budgets, like the federal government doesn't have much of a budget for anything anymore, <clears throat> you turn to industry. And industry ends up being your reclamation tool, as, as counterintuitive as that sounds. So this, sometimes I think, I think we're, we, we set up a false choice. We say, do we want wilderness or do we want outright degradation and raping and pillaging of the land? <laughs> Those are, that's a false dichotomy. It's a false choice. There's a middle, there's a middle ground there. So, you, so you're contending that, that recreational benefits can come in conjunction with con Continued. Yeah. Look at but, our tourist but, dollars. Look at, our, look, look at the tourist dollars for this state. Mm -hmm. They don't come from wilderness aficionados. They come from moms and pops and families who are looking for an outdoor experience, but they come in the station wagon, they come in the van. You know, you see these ads on TV uh, pushed by wilderness advocates. It shows mom and dad and kids playing around. You think they got there by walking 30 miles with a backpack? No, they got out of their car and walked down to the water's edge and started having a fun time. Those are not. Yeah, well, outdoor recreation is great for our economy, but we have to we have to pin it. We have to peel back the layers and say, wait a minute, that kind of outdoor recreation that brings dollars to the state is not done via wilderness. It's done via tr traditional outdoor recreation. I, Clara, I know you had something to say, but George, it's got to be your. Well, turn. I was just going to say that, that. I mean, I agree that it is a false dichotomy to say that our only two choices are billions of acres of wilderness versus a parking lot. I mean, those are not the only two choices, and I don't would never disagree that the federal government, the state government, the county governments could all do a better job and could all do a better job of working together and saying, let's let's work this out, let's manage it, let's pick the land that ought to be wilderness, let's pick the land that ought to be more accessible outdoor recreation. Let's let's throw a bone to the people who 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 seem to think that doesn't matter how old they are, they just want to play with their toys. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sorry, I and a lot of times we it seems like with if they think that if you can't drive your ATV on it, then you've somehow raped the land that way. I mean, just, there, we, we, we get, I don't we, think yeah. anyone will argue that there are extremes on both. Yeah, sides. there are, and there are definitely extremes to that. And it just seems like most of the uh, the 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 movements that I have a problem with are grown-ups who just can't stop playing with their toys and, and, and just destroy anything that's around them in, in the middle of it. Now, and wilderness also does other things other than provide recreation for, admittedly, a limited number of people. I mean, it also is, it preserves the earth, it preserves the water, it cleans the water, it cleans the air, uh, and those aren't immediate economic benefits, although they do make it possible for other things to go on uh, that are more industrial, and the as much wilderness area as we can tolerate, uh, reclaims the water, reclaims the air, and does those things that we need, even if it isn't an, an immediate economic benefit, and even if you can't go play on it. But, uh, uh, no, I gotta, gotta let Claire go on. Go ahead. Ahead. I'd like to mention uh, on the economy, the economics uh, concerning an area where there's wilderness and monuments that surround it. We take the town of Escalante in uh, Southern U in Garfield County, of course. And uh, they have gone, we have the Box Death Hollow, as I mentioned, 25,000 acres of uh, wilderness just to the north of Escalante. Surrounding Escalante to the south is the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And uh, they're sur completely surrounded by BLM Forest Service lands. And they have gone, speaking of economics, 
Escalante town itself has gone for the schools. I'm talking about the high school, six through, uh, six through 12. They've gone from around 150 students down to 70 in just the last five years. Now that's what wilderness and it, monuments has gotten the people of uh, Escalante area in and, Garfield County. And what do you think that's attributed to? Is, is, is it that the, the types of jobs are changing? Is it that, there, is it that the community is shrinking because people are... are, are They're starving. <laughs> they have to move, they have to go where they can make a living. Well, that's true all across the country, whether there's but, a national monument there. I mean, I live... In, but you, in, but you, made, you postulated mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. if you have wilderness and monuments, and parks nearby, that's going to generate the economy. It hasn't happened well, it has, in our area. Well, it has, in, it has around the Grand Canyon. It has around Yellowstone. And, and rural areas all across the country are losing population, whether they're next to a national monument or not. I lived for a long time in Kansas and, and wrote about things there. There's no national monuments there. There's no wilderness in Kansas. And small towns are drying up and blowing away as we speak. And they're, they're not, it's not they're not rescued by that, but it's not caused well, by I that think, either. Well, I think I think the bottom line on the mm -hmm. of the whole of the whole discussion is if it fits the criteria, fine. If it doesn't, leave it alone. You know, the, in Garfield County <clears throat> and the forest area, the Aquarius Plateau, and those different areas, they used to support several logging mills mm -hmm. and and good-paying jobs for families down there. The forest itself used to be free of understory, and that was this, that's currently choking it. Mm -hmm. They used to have a healthy diversity of aspen and pine there, and, and various age classes. That was before the, sorry, the leave it alone ethic mm -hmm. overtook that plateau. Is that, the, is that you're talking about the Dixie? Yeah. Well, in the Dixie National Forest. And that yeah. was the court order that uh, stopped. The well, there's been a number of court orders, yeah. but it's been mm -hmm. a slow, slow turn over a couple of decades from active management to leave it alone. On the, what I respectfully say, the mistaken and misguided ethic that says, gosh, if you leave it alone, then nature will just make it beautiful and everything will be great. What's the result? Um, choked understory, kill off of aspen, bark beetle kill because all you have is old growth that hasn't been thinned properly and managed properly. You're prone to invasive species. You're prone to uh, uh, bark beetle outbreaks. You're prone, you're prone to catastrophic wildfires. In the old days when the understory was cleared out, thanks to active management, a forest fire would come through and it would just burn minimally at the surface. Now you have canopy burn, you have complete destruction of canopy, you have CO2 that uh, does, you know, the forest fires in California that have, are so catastrophic because they leave it alone. They spew out more CO2 than, than uh, you know, millions of automobiles combined. I guess the point here is, mm -hmm. We, people need to pause and ask, is, is leave it alone really the best policy? Even if everybody agrees we ought to have a nice, beautiful, uh, nature-looking uh, hillside, is leave it alone really the best approach? Well, I think also, I mean, for one thing, you're, you're measuring beauty based on what makes a nice painting versus what nature is like. I mean, how did, the, how did these acres survive for millions of years before people were here? Did they, was there anybody there to take care of it then? No. That's the, that's the way it works. And to say that that this land was only worth anything when people started coming and, and messing around with it, I don't, I don't think is a valid uh, thing to I, say. I, now, I, we've I, made mistakes. I think we're but, way beyond But you have world. to agree that yeah. mankind is part, is part of the environment. Well, yes, mankind is part of the environment, sure. but mankind doesn't necessarily have, isn't necessarily smart enough, whether he's deciding to leave it alone or whether he's deciding to chop it down, isn't necessarily smart enough to say, I know what ought to happen on this land. I mean, the, the land was there, the forests were there, the wildlife was there, the water was there for millions of years before anybody ever found it. And sometimes it seems like it's amazing it survived without our care. Study, way, after, <laughs> study after study has shown that when you actively manage the ground, the wildlife species go up, the diversity mm -hmm. goes up, uh, the watershed is improved, and uh, the age class and, and uh, species diversity improves. Those are all hallmark standards of, of a desired end condition on any hillside. And it, we're, we're long past the ethic of, of just letting nature take care of it. Well, I think, I think part, of, part of this really is coming from the fact that, that the same thing is occurring, whether nature's doing it or man is managing it. It's just that the cycles are, 
uh, instead of dozens of years, they're thousands of years for those same cycles to go through. Sure. And so it's it's a matter of uh, do you do you want to uh, you know does mankind let those cycles take thousands of years and only every tenth generation or fifteenth generation mm -hmm. see them at their prime or do we manage to maintain their prime? And to me, that seems to be the argument, and and, well, and that becomes the as, decision. It's kind of like when every day in in the paper there's there's a new story that coffee is good for you. No, coffee is bad for you. No, uh, red wine is good. No, red wine is bad. They keep changing their mind as to what's good for us. They keep changing their mind as to what's good for for the natural world. We make mistakes. We're human. We're fallible. We we foul up. Uh, sometimes I think that we do give ourselves a little bit too much credit for knowing what to do. And sometimes I don't I don't dispute that sometimes the idea that we just leave it alone and it'll be fine isn't isn't correct. But I think the idea that people need to be in there actively managing this this dirt because otherwise it'll be bad because there aren't people there to run it. It, it was there for a long time before there were people. It's not about people there. It's having trees be there because a catastrophic fire didn't take it away. We want the trees there. We no. want a beautiful hillside. We want diverse wildlife. And so we have to take care of it. Claire? An example of what Mark's talking about in northern Arizona on the Kaibab National Forest several years ago, they had a lightning strike out there, and rather than put it out, they decided to let it burn. It burned thousands, thousands of acres of prime timber which environmentalists and others had protested cutting. So rather than to manage the forest and harvest the timber, they let the thing burn down. And now they've got a forest out there that is completely devastated, thousands of acres. Well, let's, I think at this point, the, the, the two points of thought have been clearly alliterated on the program. Uh, I'd like to take just a moment for a summary and say, uh, ask each of you, where do we go from here, and, 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 and what's the most practical, the most practical solution? Uh, and, then, and, and that practical solution eliminates the guys that think that all 22 million acres of BLM land should be wilderness, and the, the other extreme that says we should be able to go do and do whatever we want and, and give the lands back to the state and let them be sold to private property. So somewhere in between, there's an achievable goal. And I, I think that even those are going to look different. So I'd like to hear everybody's solution or their, their dream scenario of what would be the most practical solution. So let's, uh, let's start and just come down the road. Claire? Well, I, I know you're probably getting tired of hearing me say it, but I, I refer back to the, the Wilderness Act itself. If there's 5,000 acres that's roadless, and meets the criteria of wilderness, then we'll uh, look at it. If not, it ought to be out of bounds. Okay, George? Well, I just, I mean, sometimes roadless is, is problematic because somebody drove a Jeep through there eight years ago and somebody claims that that's a road and that could be a problem. But I think the Washington County solution is a good model. I think the, uh, where you do get people involved, understanding that this, long, this land belongs lock, stock, and barrel to the people of the United States of America. And I'm sorry, the congressman from Connecticut and the, and the senator from Florida does have a say in that. It's their land too. Mark? We honor what Congress said, which is give... Uh, the state of Utah and the counties the right, the equal right at the table to manage the land along with BLM, along with Forest Service. Uh, the people who are closest to the land know the land best and actually care the most for the land. And so uh, counties are uh, always ready to uh, do lands bills. Um, there are several counties who are looking at uh, wilderness uh, components of those lands bills. Let it come from the ground up. But while we're, all, while we're also saying that this little pocket here and that little pocket ought to be wilderness, we also ought to be saying through Congress, let's free up the ability to restore this hillside or to eliminate invasive species and, and sheetgrass on that mountain range or whatever it takes to bring about uh, a, beautiful, a beautiful state. This state is, is, is the, pe the people who are closest to the land love the land the most. I know that sounds a little bit strange to people back east, but they really love the land. They don't want, they're not in the business of pillaging the land. They live off the land. And so, uh, short answer, Chad, what do we, where do we go from here? Um, we, uh, we free up the counties 
to bring all the stakeholders together in their each respective county and do like what George referred to in uh, Washington County, and that's uh, come up with county-specific land proposals. Yeah, I'd like to make one quick uh, point on what George, George mentioned, uh, roads and traveling across it with a Jeep or what have you. I'd refer you to the McConnell ruling, and uh, which designate or explains what a road is. A road can be made by use. And that, that was determined in the Tenth Circuit. And, and that would be 10 years of consistent use prior to flip. Well, not, not I, I don't know as uh, you need the 10 years on, on, on the building of a road. If a road has been used and it's, it can be a two track, but it's still a road. It doesn't have to be built mechanically. And that, that was determined yeah, by. I, 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 that's true. I guess the, the ruling said that if it had if it had been regularly used. Uh, well, that's, over that's the rule on, on ownership. Yeah. Or uh, right on, on right away. Right away, yeah. but. Uh, well, it's a it's a big issue. Uh, these folks have had a chance to make a summary statement, and now it's your chance to make a summary statement at home. I think this is a very important topic. It has a lot to do with our future, particularly on the rural communities of Utah and it has an impact to your friends clear across the nation. So we would like to hear your solutions, and we would invite you to uh, go to our website, uh, make your comments. We would love to uh, hear your comments. Go to the county Facebook page, the county seat, and, and make your comments there. Tell your friends and spend some time thinking about what we have talked about today. This is an important issue. It will affect our future, and somewhere out there, there's a solution that everybody can live with and maybe it's the one you're thinking of we'd love to hear from you thank you for joining us for this extended conversation on the county seat we'll look for you next week abc 4 8 o'clock in the morning on sunday mornings we'll see you later